For just £5 a month, you can get early access to all of our podcast episodes, copies of our script, access to further information, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. Head over to patreon.com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery. £5 a month. That's cheaper than 15 minutes of parking at Bristol Airport. Yeah, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Well, hello you. Welcome to another episode. Brett's Old Time Radio Show, and welcome to my home here in, well, my summer home, still. For only another week, because this time next week we'll be heading back to the UK. So for now, we're at our little uh, summer home at the Costa Calada region of southern Spain. Huge thank you for joining me once again for our regular late night Tuesday visit to the studio archives of old time radio shows right here in southern Spain. We've had a nice day today. It's been, well, I'm not even going to tell you it's been lovely sunshine because... It's kind of like that every day. It's like Groundhog Day, really, because it's always sunny. Today, we've had, well, our friend John, who I believe I would probably now class as our garden baker, makes lovely rock cakes. So John's rock cakes were where it was at today. Very important, really, I think, to have a a garden baker. And we've been to the, uh, where have we we been today? We've been to the shopping centre. In Mercia. And that was all nice. George got himself yet another fragrance because he's addicted to them. But yeah, that was nice. So we've had a busy day. We've just been pottering around, doing our bits and pieces and just enjoying the sunshine and making the most of it, as you can imagine. I'm Brett. I'm your host for our Nighttime Podcast. Welcome to another episode. Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Oh, and uh, TikTok as well is where it's at. They're all called Brett's Old Time Radio Show. So if you want to check out our bits and pieces and just what we're up to, over here in Spain, then you can do that on our social media. If you'd like to give us a follow as well, well, that would be absolutely brilliant. We've got a supporter page at patreon.com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery. Time now for our latest adventure with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. This one's called The Case of the Stolen Naval Treaty. First broadcast on the 23rd of November, 1947. From New York, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Sherlock Holmes is portrayed by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. Tonight, the stars are frosty bright. No wind, no clouds, just clean, clear cold. Feels good to be sitting in front of your cozy fire, Dr. Watson, with our feet stretched out on the fender. <laughs> Don't get too comfortable, Mr. Harris, because tonight I'm going to tell you about, about one of Sherlock Holmes' most important cases. The case of the stolen naval treaty. A naval treaty, Doctor? A highly explosive document. Explosive? Yes, it threatened to blow the piece of Europe into bits. And did it? Now, really, Mr. Harris, you, you mustn't get ahead of the story. And let's not forget your part in the program. Right, Dr. Watson. And my part in the program is really a very simple one. My job is to tell our listeners the great big idea behind Clipper Craft Clothes. It's just this. To bring you the finest values in clothes in America at the friendly local store you can trust. Now, naturally, this is not easy. It takes real planning. It's the remarkable Clipper Craft plan that makes it all possible. Concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across America, making tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. You've a treat in store for you if you've never seen Clippercraft clothes. Beautiful Clippercraft suits that look like twice as much money and wear like it too are only forty dollars and forty three seventy five. Top coats and overcoats are only forty dollars, and sport jackets only twenty five dollars. They're so amazingly fine that we urge you to compare them with clothes selling for many dollars more. (laughs) 
And now, Dr. Watson, how about that stolen naval treaty? Mm, yes, uh, let's see. One July morning, it was the July which immediately succeeded my marriage. I, I received a communication from an old school friend, Percy Phelps. Percy's mother's brother was Lord Holhurst, the great conservative politician. This uh, rather gaudy relationship was of little value to him when we were at school, I can assure you. However, the letters seemed to be fairly urgent, so I hurried around to Baker Street. I found Holmes in his dressing gown, plunged in the middle of a chemical investigation. A large curved retort was boiling furiously in the bluish flame of a Bunsen burner. Seeing the look of concentration on Holmes' face, I seated myself in my old armchair and waited, hardly daring to breathe. Most enlightening. Most enlightening. Yes, you come at a crisis, Watson. If this slip of paper remains blue when it touches the solution, all will be well. If it turns red, it means a man's life. I, I see. Don't interrupt, Watson. This is the crucial moment. Now watch carefully. There. But I see it has burned red. A nasty blood red. Blood red is quite correct, Watson. A very commonplace murder. Well, that's the end of that little experiment. Hi ho, fill up your pipe. Then hand me the Persian slipper. All right. There you are. Hmm. So you've come on business, Watson. Yes, but uh, how did you know? The letter clutched so tightly in your right hand, not to mention the look of excitement and anxiety on your face. You are the stormy petrol of crime, eh, Watson? What is it? Well, this letter, it, it came in the morning mail. Read it to me, that's a good chap. It's from an old schoolfellow of mine. I haven't seen him for years. Yes, but what does he say? The letter is headed Briar Bray Woking. My dear Watson, I trust you still remember Tadpole Phelps, who was in the fourth form when you were in the third. You may even have heard that through my uncle's influence I obtained a good appointment at the foreign office where I was in a situation of trust until a horrible misfortune suddenly blasted my career. Do you think you could persuade your friend Sherlock Holmes to come down here to help solve this terrible mess? Assure him that the only reason I have not asked his advice sooner was because I have been completely off my head for nine weeks. I am, I am still so weak that I have to write by dictating, as you see. Your old schoolfellow, Percy Phelps. Hmm. Let me see that letter. Doesn't tell us very much, does it? Oh, hardly anything. Yet the writing is of interest. But it's not his own. Precisely. It's a woman's. But it looks like a man's. No, it's a woman's. And a woman of unusually strong character. It's always interesting to know that your client is in close contact with someone who, for good or evil, has an exceptional nature. Yes, my interest is already awakened in the matter. Then you will take the case. The next train for Woking leaves in exactly 43 minutes. Honey, what's no, we shall miss it. Gentlemen, I'll find out if Mr. Phelps can see you. Dear, dear. Oh, the old place hasn't changed since the days when I used to visit here on my vacations. Makes me feel quite young again. Ah, Sherlock Holmes, I perceive. And Dr. Watson, too, I presume. So glad you could come. Percy's been inquiring for you all morning. Poor chap. He clings to any straw. My dear man, I may look as thin as a straw, but I promise you I have more weight mentally. I perceive you yourself are not a member of the family. Oh, dear me, how did you know? The monogram on the pocket of your blazer, J.H. <laughs> of course, of course. But a moment I thought you had done something clever. My name is Harrison, Joseph Harrison. Percy is engaged to marry my sister Annie. So I shall soon be a relation, by marriage at any rate. Uh, my sister is with him now. She's nursed him hand and foot during these trying two months. Soothing his fevered brow, eh, lucky fellow? Yes, you will find them in his room. Uh, my room, rather. At least it, uh, it used to be my room. Until he came home after the catastrophe and collapsed. They couldn't carry him upstairs. He was in such a state. So they took him into my room. Uh, we'd better go in at once. 
I know how impatient he is to see you. Yes, this conversation is delightful, but after all, we did come to see Mr. Phelps. Oh, yes, yes. Quite so. Come this way. It's in this swing, next to the dining room, you see. This is the door. I'll leave you here. You can come in if you like. Oh, no, thank you, no. Invalids are always depressing, and with this misfortune hanging over his head... Oh, poor fellow. Very well. Come in. Oh, you've come at last. Uh, at least, I presume this is Sherlock Holmes. Quite. And how is your patient? Oh, he's much better, thank you. Watson, my dear fellow. Well, Terry Badger, Hello. I'm glad to see you. I hardly knew you under that moustache. I didn't delight to see you both. Oh, uh, this is my fiancée, Miss Harrison. Uh, please, sit down. Shall I leave, Percy? Oh, no, don't go, Annie. If you don't mind, Mr. Holmes. Not at all. I feel much steadier when she's here. Quite. And now, Mr. Phelps. Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, it's like this. I was a happy and successful man on the eve of being married, and then this dreadful misfortune wrecked my life. I'm a broken man. My honor gone. I, I'm ruined. Ruined, I tell you. Percy, please, you'll make yourself ill again. I'm sorry, Annie. Perhaps you'd better just tell us the facts as quietly as you can. Yes, of course, Mr. Holmes. I was, as Watson may have told you, in the Foreign Office, in a responsible position. My uncle, Lord Holdhurst, is the Foreign Minister, you know. Well, nearly eight years ago, uh, weeks rather, the 23rd of May to be exact, he called me into his private room and informed me that he had a commission of trust for me to execute. Come in. Come in. Oh, it's you, Percy. Anyone out there in the hall? No, sir. Good. Come in and lock the door. Now, come over here. I want to make sure we can't be overheard. That's it. What's up, Uncle Bert? You look tremendously solemn. It's a solemn matter, Percy. You see this piece of paper? It's a secret treaty covering our naval situation in the Mediterranean. Harmless enough in itself, but a bombshell if it should fall into the hands of... Well, a certain government. You mean... The very walls may have ears, Percy. Let us merely say the country of X. You understand? I understand. I want you to make a copy of it. I must have a complete copy by tomorrow morning. You may have to work on it the better part of the night. Oh, that's all right, sir. Uh, Joseph and his brother, you know, is going to stop by for me. We're going to take the nine o'clock train together. He can tell the family I've been kept in town on business. Very well. But leave the message with the commissioner downstairs. I don't want anyone in your room when you're copying that document. Very good, sir. When you've finished, you can put the document and the copy in my safe. You know the combination, I believe? Certainly. That's all, Percy. But don't forget, you hold the piece of Europe in your hands. I won't forget. Good night, Uncle Bert. Good night. Well, looks as though I'll have to make a night of it. I <clears> hope. <throat> Hello, Goro. You still here? Oh, yes, sir. I had some details to clear up, so uh, I thought you'd want me to stay. And, oh, that's uh, all right, Goro. You can finish tomorrow. Yes, sir. Are you sure you won't need me? No, thanks. Well, doesn't look as though I have a chance to go out for dinner. At least I can ring for coffee. Oh, confound it, that bell pull is twisted again. Ah, there we are. The rain's coming down harder than ever. Nice, jolly little evening, this is. Uh, you're sure there's nothing I can do, Mr. Phelps? Good Lord, no, Goro. Run along. Good night, sir. Good night, Goro. Hello. Who in thunder are you? I'm the commissioner's wife, sir. What's more, I'm the char lady around here. The char lady? Oh, I see. I, I don't believe I've ever had the pleasure of making your acquaintance before. No, sir, that you haven't. If you mean what I think you do. Oh, would you inquire if your esteemed spouse would spare me a, a cup of the excellent coffee he keeps hot for any pay slaves of the Empire who are obliged to work at night? You mean Herbie should bring you up a cup of coffee? Yes, please. I'll see what I can do about it. Yes, use your influence. Well, now, let's have a look at that treaty. Great Britain, 
Triple Alliance. Yes. French fleet. Complete ascendancy. I'm too drowsy. Oh, you think I'd better have a cup of coffee? Herbert! I say, Herbert! Coffee! Oh, doesn't found the fellow. Do I have to go all the way downstairs? Herbert! Mm-hmm. Fast asleep. Hey, Herbert, wake up. Hello, hello! Oh, it's you, Mr. Phelps. <laughs> yes. I came down to see if my coffee was ready. But I think the front doorbell just rang. Bell? Yes, sir. But if you was here, who rang that bell? What bell? I told you it was the... It's the bell of the room you was working in, sir. Great thunder, my bell. There's no one up there. The treaty. Oh, good heavens, I left it on the table. Quick, Herbert. We've got to get up there. Something terrible is happening. What? Oh, we're... No, don't run so fast. Pray God, it's not too late. Oh, wait, I'll open the door. Stand back up. It uh, may be armed. I've got my army revolver. What? There's no one here. What? Look, the treaty. The treaty's gone. Oh, who could have taken it? No one's been in the front way tonight, sir. And there was no one in the rooms but yourself. My wife says so. Then he must have come up the stairs and the side door and slipped out that way, too. Get after him, heaven, quickly. Uh, it may not be too late. Hurry, man, hurry. Don't you go out, sir. You'll be, you'll be soaked to the skin. Well, there's a policeman on the corner. Maybe he's seen something. I say, Bobby. Yes, sir. There's been a robbery in the foreign office. Has anyone passed this way? He's standing here a quarter of an hour, sir, and only one living soul's passed in that time. Who was it? A tall old lady in a paisley shawl. She seemed in a hurry. Well, that was my wife. Which way did she go? You're just wasting your time, sir, and every minute is of importance. Yes, all right. We'll go back and phone Scotland Yard. Oh, this is terrible, Herbert, terrible. We're ruined. Ah, never you mind, sir. You'll lose your post, perhaps. But they can't do nothing so dreadful to you. It's not myself I'm thinking of. It's England. <laughs> Officers from Scotland Yard were waiting for the charwoman when she got home. And what did they find? Nothing, absolutely nothing. And Goro, did they trace him? Yes, Mr. Holmes, but again nothing was found. Oh, I, I was frantic out of my mind. They had to get a doctor to take me home. I was delirious for seven weeks. And these two people, Goro and the charwoman, they've been under observation ever since, I suppose? Yes, with no results. You say it had been raining all evening? Yes. But you found no traces of any kind in the room? No footprints, I mean? Absolutely none. Not even those of the charwoman's muddy boots? How do you explain that? Well, the, the charwoman in the habit of taking off their boots and wearing just carpet slippers. No footprints, eh? That's enlightening. Must have come in a cab and got away that way, too. Well, that explains the policeman's not seeing him. Now then, Mr. Phelps, could anyone have been concealed in the room or in the corridor? Impossible. There, were, there was no cover of any kind. Windows? 30 feet above the ground and locked on the inside. Then it must have been the side door. Who knew you were to have the treaty in your possession? No one. I, I'd stake my oath on that. In your opinion, what would happen if those papers were to fall into the hands of a rival government? War. Almost instantaneously. But it's eight weeks and we're not at war. Therefore, it's not unfair to suppose the treaty hasn't reached them. I don't imagine the thief took the treaty in order to frame it. Quite. And he's undoubtedly waiting for a better price. There's only one clue that puzzles me. What is that? The bell. Did someone ring it to prevent the crime, or was it an accident? If we only knew why the bell was rung, we should have the solution of this case. It's even possible that he didn't... Ha-ha, of course, of course. What a fool I was not to think of that before. You, you think you can help me? Possibly, possibly. God bless you for that, Mr. Holmes. If we can keep our courage and our patience, the truth must come out. But Percy has one more adventure to tell you about. You're sure you're strong enough, darling? Oh, I feel better than I have for days. Hope is a splendid tonic, Annie. And what was this other incident, Mr. Phelps? Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, uh, last night was the very first night that I've slept without a nurse in my rooms. I was rather wakeful. I had a nightmare or two. And suddenly, I, I heard a slight noise. What kind of noise? Like a mouse gnawing a plank. 
grew louder. And all at once, there was a sharp metallic snick. Someone forcing the window. Yes, I realized that, too. I jumped out of bed and flung open the shutters. A man was crouching in the window. He was gone like a flash. What did he look like? I don't really know. He was wrapped in some sort of cloak which came across the lower part of his face. Oh, uh, one thing I am sure of. He had a long weapon in his hand that looked like a knife. I saw the gleam of it as he turned to run. I shouted after him. And then? Then I must have collapsed from the effort. The next thing I knew, I was surrounded by the entire household. Oh, uh, Joseph and the groom found marks in the flower bed outside this window. You can see them from where you sit. Dear me, yes, I'm afraid Joseph and the groom have been a bit too energetic for me to learn anything from the traces. The flower bed looks as if it had been trampled on by an army. Oh, I'm sorry. Why should a burglar, if it was a burglar, choose to enter this room? The dining room windows are much larger and more accessible. I can't imagine unless... Well, unless it's a plot against Percy. Oh, that sounds a bit melodramatic, Annie. Not at all. There's something in what Miss Harrison says. So much that Dr. Watson and I are going to take you up to London with us. Yes, but he's not very strong, you know. The trip to London will not be nearly so dangerous to your fiancé, Miss Harrison, as another night in this room. Good heavens. And another thing, Miss Harrison, you can be very helpful to us and to Mr. Mr. Phelps if you'll do one thing for me. It may take courage, but I think I can promise that you'll be in no great personal danger. What is it you want me to do? Stay in this room until you go to bed tonight. Don't leave it for an instant. Mr. Phelps' reputation and my whole future may depend on it. I'm not going to ask you to sleep here, but when you leave for the night, I want you to lock the bedroom door on the outside. Yes, but look here. Something might happen. Shh. Not a word to anyone. It's for his sake, remember. Come in. Lunch, everybody. Something especially nice for you, Percy. Come along, Annie. Oh, oh Joseph, if, if you'll excuse me, I, I have a slight headache. I, I think I'll eat in here by myself. There's a breeze, and I, I, I want to be alone. I can't say I enjoy cross-country walks in the middle of the night, Watson. I thought we were going back to London. That's what you told everybody. We get on the train with Percy and the nurse, and then we get off at the next station and leave Percy and the nurse to go up to London alone. It doesn't make sense. Stop fussing. He'll be all right. I sent him on to Baker Street. With any luck, we should be there ourselves in time to have breakfast with him. Yes, but why sneak back to Briarbrae like this? Not so loud. There's the house now. You can see its gables in the moonlight. Follow me here, through the hedge. Yes, but why the hedge when the gate's open? Not so loud. We've got to get as near to the house as possible without being seen. I say there's quite a mist rising. Ghostly-looking white strips of it over there in the meadow. I say, look. The lamp is still lit in person. I mean, in Joseph's room. Miss Harrison must have kept her promise. Shh. Yes. There she is, reading a book. Now she's put it down. She's picking up the lamp. I say Holmes. She must be getting ready to go to bed. Quite possibly, Watson. I only hope she doesn't forget to lock the door on the outside. There she goes, to the dining room. Now the light's gone. I say the mists are creeping up from the meadow, aren't they? If only the thief doesn't wait until they blanket the house. Look. The service door is opening. Excellent. I didn't think he'd wait very long. Here he comes out into the moonlight. He's wearing a long black cape. You can't see his face. He's forcing the window. He's got it open. He's climbing over the sill. We must get closer so we can see. I see he's lighting the candles on the mantel. Look, he's pulling back the rug. In the floor, I thought so. He's lifting up a board. Now then, Mr. Joseph Harrison, <clears throat> be good enough to hand over the papers you've just removed from that hiding place. Look out, Holmes, he's got a knife. <laughs> have to see Clippercraft clothes to know their excellence, and it's easy enough to see them right at your own local independent store. 
You have to see them because such superlatively fine quality, sold at such low prices, amazes even the experts. Suits are only $40 and $43.75. Top coats and overcoats are only $40. And sport jackets, only $25. The fit is beautiful, the woolens are long-wearing, the tailoring is really superb. The famous Clippercraft plan makes this sheer magic possible. Concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores across the nation. Giving you the savings from this group buying at the store you trust. Selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. Let's return to 221 B. Baker Street, where Percy Phelps is anxiously awaiting the arrival of Sherlock Holmes. But it's almost nine now, Mrs. Hudson, and Holmes said they'd be here for breakfast at nine. Now, don't you worry, Mr. Phelps. If he says he'll be here for breakfast, he'll be here. It's when he don't say, (laughs) that's when you don't know whether it'll be breakfast or supper he'll be wanting next. What did I tell you? Here they are now, driving up in a handsome cab. There's the front door, and it's nine to the second. Good morning, Mrs. Hudson. Good morning, sir. Breakfast is on the table, piping hot. But I say, Holmes, you've been wounded. Your hand's all tied up. Just a scratch. Hmm, breakfast. Three covered dishes, splendid. And plenty of steaming coffee. Excellent. Did you... Uh, I mean... Has come, it... come, come. Business can wait until after breakfast. You look as if you needed a bit of nourishment, Mr. Phelps. Well, I, I'm really not very hungry. Well, we are, aren't we, Watson? I'm ravenous. Aha. What's this? Mmm. Curried chicken. And, uh, this... Ham and eggs. Better and better. Uh, which will you take, Mr. Phelps? Uh, thank you. I, I couldn't touch a thing. Oh, come. Try the dish before you. I, I'd rather not, really. Well, then, I suppose you have no objection to helping me. Let's see what that dish contains. Certainly. What? It's papers. It's the naval treaty. The naval... Oh, God bless you, Mr. Holmes. God bless you. You saved me and you've saved England. Don't mention it, my dear chap. Don't mention it. When did Holmes first begin to suspect this Harrison fellow, Dr. Watson? When he heard that Percy was expecting him to stop by for him, Mr. Harris. I'm afraid uh, Joseph's character was blacker than one would judge from his appearance. We learned later that he had lost heavily in dabbling in stocks. And he thought he could turn the treaty into money. Yes. Besides, no one but Joseph could be so anxious to get into that bedroom because no one but Joseph could have concealed anything there. Also, the attempt was made the first night the nurse was out of the way. Therefore, the intruder was well acquainted with the house. But the bell, Dr. Watson, why was that so significant? Well, Mr. Harris, it showed that the thief uh, had not come there to Percy's office to steal the papers. He, He came for another reason, by appointment, as we know. He rang the bell and then happened to see the papers. Uh, Dr. Watson, was he convicted? No, the case was never brought to court. It would have been a too ticklish a position for the foreign office. He was advised, however, to get out of the country and stay out. And did Percy marry the sister doctor? He did. And to this day, I don't believe she knows why her brother never returns to England. Why, that was an exciting case, Dr. Watson. And now, what story are we to have next week? Well, uh, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell, uh, tell about the Cornish horror, 
or the cradle that rocked itself. The cradle that rocked itself? Yes, Mr. Harris, the, the rocking cradle was supposed to indicate that someone in the Trevining household was about to die. As a matter of fact, there were two deaths and another that hopes... Were... Well, <laughs> suppose I leave that till next week, eh? Makers of Clippercraft Clothes and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the case of the cradle that rocked itself. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcasts in New York, see your local Clippercraft dealer, and he'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. This is the world's largest network, serving more than 450 radio stations, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed our latest adventure with Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. More adventure tomorrow with Rocky Jordan from the Cafe Tambourine in Egypt, going live at 5 p.m. GMT. As I mentioned earlier, we've got a supporter page at patreon.com forward slash Sunday Night Mystery. But for now, thanks for listening. I'll be with you. Seven days a week, each and every week. And I'll see you tomorrow on Brett's Old Term Radio Show. Love you. Bye. Check out our fabulous new podcast, Sunday Night Mystery. Every Sunday at 3 p.m. GMT, we delve into unsolved mysteries with gripping tales, thrilling theories, and captivating investigations. From infamous cases to lesser-known mysteries, each episode promises suspense and intrigue. Join the conversation and subscribe now on your favorite podcast platform. Sunday Night Mystery, every Sunday from 3 p.m.